as we come to the end of the Russian um, monarchy and the Romanov dynasty, I think what's best to do is to just look at the the timeline of events. I'm not usually um, very uh, much of a fan of just listing off a series of events, but so many things happen between the uh, months of February and March of 1917 that we need to, to look at each bit individually. Okay, So we'll have a look at the timeline of events. So on the 9th of January, 150,000 workers demonstrated in Petrograd on the anniversary of Bloody Sunday. Okay. On the 14th of February, 100,000 workers from 58 factories were on strike and the Duma demanded the abdication of the Tsar. So, so this had the support. So this actually had the support from the Duma. So support from the Duma. From the Duma, which is very interesting. Okay. There was also news in February, on the 19th of February, that bread would become rationed, okay, from the 1st of March. This brought panic because this was more rationing that was happening and suggested that the war wasn't going very well. Most people knew the war wasn't going very well at this point, and this was um, just reiterating that fact. On the 22nd of February, um, 20,000 workers from Patilov Works went on strike, and there was a march on International Women's Day on the 23rd of February, the day after. On the 24th and the 25th of February, demonstrations grew more menacing amid increasing calls for an overthrow of the Tsar. So the Tsar's abdication was almost, almost inevitable at this point, okay? And then on the 26th, things were made worse when Nicholas authorised the use of troops and ordered the dissolving of the, of the Duma. So at this point, this point here, the Tsar's abdication was inevitable, okay? So uh, Tsar... So the Tsar's abdication, abdication was inevitable, especially because not just that everyone was demanding it, but the fact that Nicholas responded in the way that he did with dissolving the Duma or ordering the dissol uh, the dissolution of the Duma, and also um, using the authorizing the use of troops on the um, on the demonstrators, and then two days later, Nicholas left his HQ and returned to Petrograd, but his train was diverted. His ministers were arrested, of uh, arrested. Uh, oh, sorry, arrested on the authority of what is known as now the Provisional Committee, okay? This is what was became known as the uh, pro Provisional Committee, was almost the provisional government that was set up in, in replacement of the Tsar, okay? And this Provisional Committee led to the Petrograd Soviets, okay? The Petrograd Soviets proclaimed control over the military, and this was order number one. So the Tsar had abdicated at this point. And the 1st of March, the Duma and the Soviets agreed to support the creation of a provisional government. Okay. And then on the 2nd of March, the official abdication of the Tsar had happened. Okay. He abdicated in favour of his brother. And his brother Mikhail refused the throne unless a constitutional monarchy was set up. Okay. Now this is very interesting. So his brother Mikhail... Um, for, he's first of all refused the throne and he said that he would only take the throne if he was welcomed to taking the throne and a provisional constitutional monarchy was set up and the government would run legislation however he was assassinated not long after okay and then the Tsar and his family were put under house arrest okay so this is what happened this is how the this is how the Tsar fell from power. It took from the 9th of January all the way to the 3rd of March before the Tsar uh, officially abdicated. So the provisional government was now set up uh, in replacement of the Tsar's authority. So the Rus uh, Russia was left with two ruling authorities, the provisional government and the Soviet, the Petrograd Soviet, okay? 
and the Soviet agreed to accept the provisional government for the time being. So the so the Soviet agreed to uh, just let the Soviet gov- uh, provisional government run run the run the prob- uh, run the country, and this was known as the dual authority. Uh, Prince Lvov became prime minister. Alexander Kerensky was the only socialist in this new government, and the Petrograd Soviet mainly comp- was mainly comprised of SRs and Mensheviks, so the radical left. There were a number of issues with the provisional government. The provisional government promised civil liberties. It promised an amnesty for political prisoners. Okay. Um, and sorry, and the abolition of capital punishment, uh, the appointment of independent judges, and the Soviet agreed. So these were these were seen as uh, good things for the um, for the provisional government. However, the issues are actually down here. The provisional government continued to fight World War One despite losing, despite despite losing the war. Okay, losing the war. And this obviously led to continuing protests. And by summer of 1917, so by only a few months later, okay, so a few months later, a few months later, okay, the, there was very little support left for the provisional government. So although the Soviets agreed, at first it began to, uh, it began to collapse and support began to collapse. So this has been... A number of a number of events happened between uh, sort of January and March of 1917. 1917 was a very important year for for Russian history. Okay, and it, it only made sense to just look at each individual thing as it happened day by day, almost day by day, officially. Okay, and then the third of March we see the abdication of the Tsar, and the provisional government is then um, created. <clears throat> 